Okay, so we had a nice intro of the thermonuclear supernova. I'm going to talk about the other type of supernova that we observe, um, and that's the uh, uh, supernova from stellar collapse. Um, and I actually thought that uh, Fritz did a, a nice thing of introducing who he was and what, what he actually does. I'm, I'm Chris Fryer. I'm, I've been working in supernova um, for over 20 years now. Um, I am the director of the uh, Center for Theoretical Astrophysics at Lano, so I thought I would plug what we do a little bit here. Um, you can go to astrophysics.lano.gov and see a little bit about Los Alamos. There's over 20 permanent astrophysics scientists at the lab. Most of them are working on astrophysical transients. Um, this is a picture of the lab. It's up in the mountains. Um, if you go down into the valley, you can go to see uh, Indian uh, ruins, ruins of the Indian reservation, uh, Indian um, settlements. Uh, in the, it turns out the Indian settlements were only there. It's not like it's a young country, the United States. So this was actually in AD 1000 that these people were living in these um, caves. Um, this is a picture of our ski hill, just so you see that we also have ski hill. I, I like it that Colorado is claiming it, but this is actually in New Mexico. Um, it's a New Mexico ski hill. This is the run going down to our lodge. Um, it is about eight kilometers from the town itself, so it's right next to us, um, just in the mountains up here. Um, so for theoretical astrophysics works on a broad range of uh, astrophysical problems, but you'll see that they're all kind of related to uh, transients. There's some cosmology and studies of first stars, first star formation, some study of active galactic nuclei, star and planet formation, but then a lot of the work is things like engines behind astrophysical transients, nuclear astrophysics, nucleosynthesis, supernova remnants, um, the emission from these transients, cosmic rays, and uh, we do a series, and I'll show some of this, um, of experimental astrophysics, where we use laboratory experiments to try and study um, uh, the physics behind these astrophysical problems. Um, so what are we trying to explain? Uh, we ha have these supernova that go off, so you're gonna get uh, information, kind of the same information, but multiple ways, especially in these intro talks. On, on what we're trying to explain and what we do. The difference between core collapse supernova and, and thermonuclear supernova is that I think they kind of have been producing explosions for longer than we have in core collapse. Um, core collapse supernova, the hard part was just to even make an explosion happen. So here's a, here's a supernova, here's a galaxy, here's a supernova going off, here's a galaxy, here's a supernova going off. Um, in, in stellar collapse, it's harder even to get an explosion. And in fact, sometimes our models fail. And in sometimes in nature, the models fail. We know this. Um, so we, in, in our case, it's actually difficult to make those explosions. The kind of observations we've been worried about is how do we make the energy? So how do we actually get some star to blow up like this? Um, and we know it's even worse than that. We have some that blow up and they make things like gamma ray bursts. So this is the famous uh, uh, supernova associated with gamma ray bursts 980425. And we'll talk about a lot more about um, gamma ray burst engines and how they've affected supernova in, um, in the talk, uh, a talk tomorrow in my third lecture. Um, but it's these explosions that we're trying to explain. This is what we need to explain to um, kind of um, match the, the um, uh, supernova observation. So, Instead of going into a lot of details on the light curve like Fritz did for my first talk, I'm just gonna give you a talk on how do we even get, think we can get the um, explosion and the energies from these explosions. So I'm gonna talk about how do we power these explosions. And since I'm coming from Los Alamos National Lab, I figured I would show a different kind of explosion that's made uh, more on the Earth, but still quite powerful. This is more like uh, Fritz's explosions though, because this is thermonuclear. And so, the, um, but I will, I will point out that even though they have been getting explosions longer and they've been working on uh, these kind of explosions, uh, you know, going to the details more so than us, the core collapse engine was the first engine really proposed to explain um, uh, core collapse supernova. So the term supernova was termed by Bade and Zwicky. So uh, the other thing I thought I would point out is that it seems like the Swiss have been playing a role in, uh, in supernova from the beginning. So Bade and Zwicky uh, termed supernova in 1934, 
Here's a picture of Fritz Wicke. Um, Fritz was, grew up in, in Switzerland uh, uh, for his first few years. He then ended up spending most of his career um, in California uh, using, uh, setting up uh, a large telescope to, to observe these supernova. Um, but Fritz didn't just go and observe them. When they discovered the neutron, shortly thereafter, um, Fritz Zwicky actually proposed that the collapse of a stellar core down to a star just made out of neutrons would be the power, could provide the power to make a supernova. Um, I will tell you there, there was one other person that uh, wrote a paper on this in the, that late 1930s, and that was uh, Robert Oppenheimer, um, the founder of Los Alamos National Lab. So it was the discovery of the neutron, they realized they can make something that was incredibly compact, and they could take the energy from just the potential energy released by taking a you know, white dwarf core, and uh, so it's a, the iron core of your massive star, so something that's about the size of a white dwarf, so 10,000 kilometers, and collapse it down to 10 kilometers and make a, a, a strong explosion. And this, so the energy released as you, if you go from a core of an uh, iron core of a star around 10,000 kilometers down to a 10 kilometer neutron star is about 10 to the 53 ergs. Um, now the issue with core collapse supernova, so I just said we released 10 to the 53 ergs. The problem is that most supernova are only 10 to the 51 ergs. And Hans Bethe termed the, to, uh, the, uh, the, the unit he called this 10 to 51 ergs, one foe. The F is for 50, the O is for one, the E is for ergs. So he liked this term. This was a term he put. Um, uh, a whole group of us will use only foe for the rest of our lives. But it turned out when Hans Beta passed away, um, the people that didn't like this as a joke decided that they should honor Beta by not using his term, but instead using um, uh, what he his name, so this is now called the beta as well. So you either hear a foe or a beta, um, depending on whether um, you like that term or, or you like this one. Um, I will only use foe, uh, because that's what Hans Beta said. If it was good enough for him, it was good enough for me. Um, so I also want to show you some pictures of the, the people that played a big role in shaping this, this, this theory. So we had this picture. We have 10 to the 53 ergs. We only need 10 to the 51. You think, okay, we're done. Anything in nature can be 1% efficient. It, it can't be that hard. Um, so you, you don't have to really worry about it. We're, we, we know we have the energy. We can explain these explosions. Um, the problem is, is when we actually, we actually tried to model these. Uh, so now it's cutting it off some. Um, that's, that's great. Um, when you actually try to model these, um, it's, it's actually very difficult to get them to explode. So you can do the collapse down. Now here's some calculations by Stern and Colgate in the 60s, where he would collapse the star, and you, this, the, the core would collapse, and then it would kind of sit there. And this, what these different lines are, are different parts of the, ma the star. So he's just looking at, he has a star laid out like this, and he's taking it at the 10% point, the 20% point, the 30% point, and just watching it fall in. And here he has a star falling in, and there it is. It just collapses and sits there. So it, it doesn't explode. It turns out that it collapses, it, it falls down in there, energy gets leaked out, but not much mass comes out in the end in these models. It mostly just piles up. So he's not actually driving an explosion. Um, <clears throat> when, they actually, when they put in the physics, when they put in the neutrino physics, what happens is the, the material falls in and then it just, the neutrinos leak out the energy and you, don't get, you get a fizzle, you get a black hole. Um, so what Sterling, Colgate, and uh, his collaborator, uh, it was Colgate and White were the papers, um, argued was you collapse down in, but somehow the neutrino is coming out. So it gets so hot that the energy is, the radiation energy, photons are trapped. So it's hot, so dense and hot, the, the photons are trapped, but it's so hot that there's a lot of neutrinos emitted. The neutrinos are what are leaking out of this core. The neutrinos are depositing energy. He argued, well, I'll collapse down to this neutron star. I'll get neutrinos out. They will somehow power explosion. And if he took some of the energy from the collapsed core, this 10 to the 53 ergs, and deposited in outside of the proto-neutron star in the form of neutrinos, he could drive an explosion. But this was ad hoc. 
he just said, I'm going to take some of this energy from the core. If I take 1% of it and put it into the star, the layers of the star above the proto-neutron star, I get an explosion. But he did show that that is possible, that there is a way you could do this. And this is what Colgate and White did in 1966. So this was our model in 1966 is somehow that potential energy released in that proto-neutron star, the only way to really get it out, because it's it's dense, it's 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cube, is to get it out through neutrinos. We'll get it out through neutrinos, we'll deposit it in the outer layers of the star and drive an explosion. Um, but that still doesn't have the model worked out, but at that point we now had a second model that maybe worked. So we had the two models, we had the collapse of a normal star um, down to a neutron star that Bonnie and Zwicky uh, proposed, and then we had the thermonuclear explosion of a star that Hoyle and Fowler uh, proposed in 1960, and this is what Fritz is talking about. Um, we now know that both of these exist in nature. Um, and so this gets you to the point that you might also consider what other kind of models can you have? Um, are there magnetic field models? And in fact, we're going to talk about some of these later in the lectures. Are there other ways to drive explosions? And Fritz showed you this as well. There's the normal super, um, 1A supernova, but there's a lot of weird things going on. In the same way, there's a normal core collapse supernova, but there's a lot of weird supernova going on, and we want to understand how do they, you know, what are the models for this. Um, and there's a big thing in science where they say we believe in Occam's razor. We believe in this thing where, you know, in, in, um, in the translation, English translation, plurality should not be posited without necessity, from William of Occam. So this is Occam's razor. The, the kind of, the, the, the Newton translation of this is, we are to admit no more causes of natural things than such as are both true and sufficient to explain their appearances. So the, the kind of interpretation of scientists is that if you don't need another model for something, if you have a standard model that seems to explain everything, we are not going to take this other model. We're going to take the best one, and that's going to be our standard, and we're not going to go beyond that. I'm going to be looking at what is our standard model for core collapse supernova. That's what we're going to go through the, the lecture. But we also have another rule in, in um, science, which isn't as often stated, but often used by scientists anyway, which is one that uh, Kip Thorne uh, quoted from a book by T.H. White. It's called The Once and Future King. It's a, um, it's a story about King Arthur. Um, in T.H. White's version, the way Merlin teaches King Arthur is he turns King Arthur into different animals, puts them in that animal kingdom, and makes them learn about whatever they're learning, uh, whatever those animals have to teach them about politics or whatever it is. And in front of the, uh, the he got turned into an ant, and in front of the ant hill there was a sign that said, that which is not strictly forbidden is mandatory. That is what most scientists do. They don't do Occam's razor. They do the other. They say, if I can prove that this can explain something, I want it to be there. Um, Kip Thorne used it for an object called Thorne Zipkoff objects, which, by the way, I think is strictly forbidden and doesn't exist. But, um, but you know, most scientists, if they could come up with a way to explain something, they will have a model. This is why we have a lot of models in, the, in, in theories for supernova. We have two standards. Um, and both Fritz and I will be representing those standards, but there's a lot of other models that exist. Um, the goal of the people that want to propose other models is to convince, you know, know whether or not it really is strictly forbidden or not. So in the case of um, thorn zikoff objects, thorn zikoff objects are an object where you take a neutron star, put it in the center of a star, and now I'm going to accrete slowly that, set, that core of that massive star is accreting onto the neutron star that I put in the center, and it's going to power the supernova. The problem, and the reason it's strictly forbidden, is at those conditions, you start emitting neutrinos. So you actually cannot put a neutron star in the center of another star and expect it to live for a long time. What will happen is it'll creep like crazy. It'll drive a strong explosion. In fact, it's not so different than a supernova. Um, but at the time, uh, Kip Thorne did not put in the, he and Anna Zitkoff did not put in the neutrino physics, and so did not really realize that it would not exist. But this is, a, so you, you could always propose a model, you could say it works, but then once you start studying the physics, you find out whether or not it does. And in, in, in core collapse supernova, this is the game, because we have a model, 
We have 10 to the 53 ergs from it. Can we make it work? Or does nature uh, strictly forbid it? So there's two different rules. Uh, we use them both in, in, in science. But I, I will say that I've seen a lot more in the literature now where people just say, oh, I have this model. It's magnetic fields. It's doing this. And it's not strictly forbidden yet, primarily because we don't know enough about magnetic fields. But that's, what, that's the goal. If you're going to use this mantra and not this rule, you have to start studying the physics to make sure you don't uh, pr propose a wrong model. This is what the, the game that we did play with supernova for a long time, so since the 60s. And these are two of the protagonists in the 60s on ruling out one model or the other. So there was a time when we had a supernova going off. We didn't know that there was two types. We didn't know there was Stillinger and core collapse supernova. And there were two people championing the different models in the, in the 60s. Dave Arnott was championing, championing the um, type 1A models, the thermonuclear models. Sterling Colgate was championing the, uh, the core collapse model. The nice feature of this is every time Sterling would pa uh, publish a paper, Chandrasekhar was the editor of AppJ, every time Sterling would publish a paper, Chandrasekhar would show the paper to Dave Arnett and say, make a contrary paper. Tell me why Sterling Colgate is wrong. And so there's a series of papers, you'll see them, Colgate and White, 1966, Arnett, 1966, where they just went one paper after another, where Sterling would say, I think this is the answer. And Dave Arnett would say, oh, no, no, but then this will happen. And then Sterling Colgate would come back, well, I'm going to solve that. So there's a, a paper by Arnett and Cameron saying, if you explode off of a neutron star, it's going to be, you're going to eject a whole bunch of neutron-rich elements. And they're going to be bad because we don't see that many neutron-rich elements. So you have a problem with this, this, bad, this bad ejecta that's neutron-rich. How are you going to explain that bad neutron-rich ejecta? So Sterling Colgate came back with an idea of, oh, well, that material is going to fall back down. And it'll fall back down and be in the neutron star. Um, and, and they went through a series of this where they kept on improving the models. And by the early 70s, we really knew both of these engines very well. But it was partly because these people had both come up with models. So they had followed T.H. White. And then they spent time trying to kill each other's models. Um, and in the end, they both, both models became much stronger. Um, and a lot of the physics that these guys discussed in the 60s and early 70s is, is indeed still the physics that we understand for supernova today. Um, so I'm going to talk about core collapse supernova. Um, I think the first thing we need to do is make sure we understand stars. Um, and we don't have someone giving a talk, you know, a, 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 you could have a, a, third, a fourth lecturer talking just about stellar evolution. Um, and that could fill up easily nine lectures on, on stellar evolution uh, for massive stars. Unfortunately, you're just going to have, I, I think, some talks by me. Um, and this will be my, my talk in the afternoon. We'll really focus on stars. But you, you should have some, you, you probably need to see this diagram multiple times before you ever get it. It's called a Kippenhahn diagram. Um, and you can't see this axis. This is actually the enclosed mass of the, the star. So this is the very center, the core of the star. This is out, this was a 22 solar mass star. So this is at 22 solar masses. So I'm just looking, if I go from here and start going in, I'm looking at the interior star. This axis is the time during the star's life. So this is when the star is born. It's full 22 solar masses. As time goes on, the mass of the star decreases. It's losing mass through winds. So this is the mass, a lot of wind mass in the star. This axis is in log space. So this is 10 to the 7 years. 10 to the 6 years, 10 to 4 years, 100 years, one year left in the life of the star. Down here is one second left in the life of the star. So this is going through the um, star's life toward its end in a log space. So most of the life of the star is spent in this hydrogen burning phase, where in the very core, hydrogen is fusing, making helium. Um, you have a little bit of mass loss. So, so some wind mass loss, but that's essentially what's happening in the star. Um, the color code in this is the green slashes are convection. The red is this thing where it's kind of convective. It's semi-convective, so it's semi-convection. The, the blue is where energy is being generated. 
This magenta color is where energy is being lost through neutrinos. So the net energy in those zones is either decreasing or increasing um, in these regions. So what you see during the hydrogen burning phase is you have hydrogen burning in the core. So there's, it's convective. It's convective all the way out here. So this whole region is burning from hydrogen into helium. Um, you see, uh, um, you see so, but this is the core hydrogen burning phase. You see uh, energy generation happening here. So it's bluish. Um, and that's, that's the 10, you know, the 10 million, 90% of the star's life. At some point, it runs out of hydrogen in the core, becomes a helium core, and it starts to, that helium core contracts, the rest of the star expands, and it goes into the giant phase. So this is it, as it goes into the giant phase, it starts to lose a lot more mass through winds. Um, it starts burning helium, and then it starts, at some point, it starts quickly burning helium in the core. So now helium is dominating the energy generation rate. And there's a little bit of generation in a hydrogen shell right on top of the helium core um, that's generating energy. Um, that goes for, the, uh, for about a million years. And then about 10,000 years before the death of the star, you go through a series of other phases where first you get things like helium shell burning. So now I have this, this carbon oxygen core on top of it, I have helium. I can get helium shell burning. The carbon can eventually ignite, and it typically ignites about 100 years before um, the death of the star. You can also get, after it burns all the carbon in the core, it can burn carbon in the shell. So here's it burning carbon in the shell. Here's it uh, burning carbon in the shell more at the end of its life. And you go through a series of carbon core burning, oxygen core burning, silicon core burning. At this point, I've made an iron core in the center of the star. So the iron core is right here. This is the mass of the iron core at the end of the star's life. And this is about three solar masses in this, in this model. So I made a three solar mass um, iron core. On top of that iron core is a silicon shell and then an oxygen shell a carbon shell, and it's all burning on top. So I have this explosive burning on top of the, this iron core that just keeps on increasing mass. Um, the problem with this uh, picture for stars is that you keep on building this mass of the iron core, and eventually it's not going to support itself, and it's going to collapse. And that's where we get the supernova engine. And so that's how you produce a star like this. And this is supernova 1987A. So this. Supernova 1987A played the biggest role in defining what we know about supernova. Um, it is, uh, uh, it was a, you know, a nearby supernova. It provided us a wide range of signals. And probably the strongest thing it did to constrain the, uh, the kind of our understanding of supernova is we actually saw the star. We had an image of um, the star before it died. So we actually, this is the proof that at least some supernova are produced by stars that then end their lives. So we, we then this, we had the bright supernova. We waited until the supernova dimmed. We looked, is that star still there? It was not there anymore. So the star actually disappeared. It was the end of one star's life. Um, we just had a big meeting on, uh, so this is such an important supernova that every five, 10 years, we have another meeting in honor of the supernova to discuss what we've learned about supernova since then. Um, uh, in fact, you will find that a lot of my slides are lifted from various people's talks on uh, core collapse supernova during this meeting. Um, so I'll have some uh, slides from Georg Rafelt, Alex Hager, Raphael Hershey, um, simply because they were giving their reviews on how core collapse supernova works in different aspects. Um, huh. That's a, oh well. Okay, so I have at least other issues that happen to my slides. Um, this is uh, the other thing that made Supernova 1987A a strong constraint on supernova is that we actually saw neutrinos from it. So it was the first detection and now only, still only detection of neutrinos from a supernova. Um, it's because this was the only supernova that was close enough to be seen since we had neutrino detectors. It was detected, and I'll talk a lot more about neutrinos in the future, but this is what proved that it had to be something that collapsed onto a neutron star. 
You can't do this with the type 1A, the thermonuclear supernova. You can't produce these neutrinos. So the, um, this really did prove that um, neutrinos, the core class picture is correct. Um, the progenitor star, unfortunately, for 1987A was not a nice red supergiant like the stellar models had predicted. It was a blue supergiant, so it was a compact um, star. So something is wrong with our, our picture. The other thing that happened that was weird was that there were gamma rays that appeared uh, early in the emission. We had predicted that all the nickel would be produced down in the core. We wouldn't see gamma rays for a while. They appeared early. I'm going to talk about that in a bit because that's what actually dictates how we understand what supernova are. There were red shifted lines that we didn't understand. We thought it would be a nice spherical explosion um, and you would just see, you know, broaden lines but not red shifted in one direction. Um, and so there was a lot more but, but, but. Things are not what we pictured. We did get, core collapse did work. Um, we got the neutrinos, but that's about all we got that was at the detail level correct. Um, so let me talk about some of these things that went wrong and how it shaped what we saw for the explosion. So when 1987A went off, Stan Woolsey and Phil Pinto said, okay, we're gonna predict the gamma rays from the supernova, and here's their model predictions. So the supernova explodes, it produces nickel in, in its core, so you have this nickel uh, center, it produces nickel in the core, it's burning the rest of the star, it, it drives the star outward. You can easily just say, I have this nickel down in there, I'm going to explode this star, I'm going to look at when, does, when do the gamma rays actually get out from this supernova. So here, here's the prediction for, from um, Pinto and Woosley. At 150 days, you're not going to see anything. At 200 days, you're not going to see anything. At 250 days, you're just going to start getting a gamma ray signal coming out from this nickel that's down in the core, finally getting out to the edge of the star. At 300 days, you'll see a nice whopping signal. 500 days, it'll start to decrease. I've already plotted on here the observations for these different times. So at 150 days, they had some signal. 200 days, it was a strong signal. Um, here's the theory prediction. So this is a log space. This is energy band. Um, we're two orders of magnitude off here. 250 days, we start matching the data. 300 days, it looks good. It does last a little bit longer than we, uh, the, the core collapse models predicted. Um, so this was, the, this was a conundrum. What happened? So what Pindo and Eastman decided was, oh, sorry, Pindo and Woosley decided was, somehow this material had to get mixed out further than it did. So they did that. They, they said, I'm going to take that nickel, but somehow mix it out. I'm going to say it gets out into the star. The explosion has to have some way of mixing this nickel out and getting it out in, into the star. So they did that artificially. They just artificially took that nickel and said it spread out in the whole star. And then they can match the observations. So this is what the observations have told us now. So the second hint, the first hint is yes, it collapsed down to a, a neutron star. We got neutrinos, that's good. It's a weird progenitor, it's not a red supergiant, it's a blue. But, but you know, if, if w the basic idea is right, now somehow it has to mix more than we're seeing. So this got theorists working on how do we mix things. So another Swiss scientist, Willie Benz, um, worked working with uh, a student of his, um, Mark Courant, when they were both in Harvard, decided let's see if we can see somehow mix this nickel out. So they started studying the engine and they started a asking the question, I collapsed down to a proton neutron star, what happens if above the proton neutron star I get some turbulence going on and that turbulence can mix stuff out? Can I get something that does that? And they found if they just tried to mix it, if they just drove a spherically symmetric explosion and tried to get it to mix on its own, as it's just going through the star, that wasn't enough mixing. They actually had to have a convective engine. They had to have the engine itself mix to drive an explosion. So they did that. They worked on, they, they, they said, okay, this, we must have an engine that is convectively unstable right above the proto-neutron star. And that is actually what drove us to the current idea we have for core collapse supernova, which is this idea that you have, so I'm gonna just go briefly over this explosion mechanism. The idea that we have, which is, um, you have this massive iron core, it keeps on getting bigger from the stars, uh, star bur stellar burning, this shell burning, so the iron core gets bigger and bigger. 
at some point it's not able to support itself, it starts to contract some. So it's so heavy it starts to contract. It contracts till it gets to densities where the electrons on the, in, in the iron core can start capturing onto the protons, making a neutron and a neutrino. So I'm supporting this core, this iron core, through two things, thermal pressure and electron degeneracy pressure. If I start to capture electrons onto the protons and make a neutron and a neutrino, I remove that electron degeneracy pressure. So I now have less pressure to support myself. I'm going to contract even further. Pretty soon I have a runaway process where the electrons are capturing so rapidly that the, there's almost no pressure supporting that iron core anymore, and it's going to be a runaway collapse. The other supported pressure was thermal pressure. It was iron, uh, the, the, just the hot iron. The, and the other thing that can happen there is the iron starts to dissociate. You spend all your time gaining energy by burning hydrogen into, um, hydrogen into helium, helium all the way up to iron. You spent, you've gained a whole bunch of energy to power the star by doing this, and now I start to collapse and I dissociate all that iron, all those iron particles, back into helium atoms, to alpha particles. And in doing so, I remove a lot of the thermal energy. All that energy I had gained by, um, by burning it, I'm now taking it back away. And so you get this runaway collapse, and this is a picture of a 3D simulation, but just put on 1D, where this is radius. 1, 10, 100, and 1,000 kilometers. This is velocity going from 0 to a minus 0.1 times the speed of light. So it's falling in at a tenth the speed of light, this core. It's got runaway, and it just fell in um, at one-tenth the speed of light. So 3 times 10 to the 9 centimeters per second, it's, it's collapsing in. And it collapses in like that until it gets down to nuclear densities. And at nuclear densities, two things happen. You now have both neutron degeneracy pressure playing a role and nuclear forces, and they halt the collapse. So it gets down to about 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cubed, and the collapse stops. Um, it causes it to bounce, and so here's the bounce. This is 1, 10, 100 kilometers. This is plus about 0.8, this is about 0.8 times the speed of light, point, sorry, 0 0.08, so about you know, 2 times 10 to the 9 centimeters per second, and this is fa still falling in at more than a tenth the speed of light, so more, more like five times 10 to the nine centimeters per second. So you have the rest of the star falling in, but that inner core is now stopped because of nuclear forces and neutron degeneracy forces, and it drives a bounce. Um, and this was the picture that uh, Sterling Colgate thought would work, um, now with a lot more details in it. The problem is that that bounce moves out, and then it, it falters. It falters because most of the energy in this shock is in heat and it's in the form of neutrinos. As soon as this becomes optically thin for neutrinos, it loses all of its energy and it stalls. So this bounce shock moves out some distance and then stalls and you get the following picture. Here's the proto-neutron star. This is a slice of a 3D simulation. This is zero kilometers, this is 500 kilometers on this side, minus 500 kilometers on this side. So I'm looking at just a slice, looking in, has about a radius of 500 kilometers. That's where the shock went out to before it stalled. So that bounce shock moved out to about, well, in fact, this case, 300 kilometers. The bounce shock moved out to 300 kilometers and stalled. I have this hot proto-neutron star, it's leaking out energy. Um, the color coding here is an entropy, so this is High entropy material, it's trying to bubble out. This is low entropy material falling in. This is the model that Harant and Benz were pushing, was that we need to somehow get some high turbulence in the engine to get the mixing we need to get the nickel to explain the gamma rays that we observe. Um, this is that the rest of the star is falling in, so the vectors are actually showing the, the velocity. The star is falling in. Here's my proto-neutron star. I have hot material bubbling out. I have cold material streaming down in. And somehow, in our engine, we need to be able to take that energy that is tap, you know, boiling down in here and drive an explosion. We have to overcome this infalling star to drive an explosion. So this is kind of now our standard picture. We have lots of Lots of groups are, are repeating these results. So here's uh, a result by Lentz et al. in 2015. This is Melson et al. in 2015 as well. Um, we're starting to get more and more of our calculations 
produce explosions, but it's a case where you change the physics slightly and you fail and you just make a black hole. And you might think that that would tell you, oh, this is not a very good model because it's not that robust. It sometimes succeeds, it sometimes fails. Do, do we, you know, that's, you know, you, when you're right on that border, do you really like it? Do you, you know, you know Fritz Röpke, his models, they always explode. Um, um, but in these core collapses, it's not the case. Um, the issue with core collapse is you don't want it to be that case because we have systems out there that we know are black holes. We know sometimes when a star collapses in on itself, it forms a black hole, not a neutron star. Um, but you also want it that at least sometimes you make explosions. And these are two cases where uh, that we are starting to get produce explosions. Um, where we argue about now in the core class, where we're at right now, and you know, when people argue what's, what's, what's the deal with the supernova engine, is typically on what's the most important physics to drive the explosion? Do I need to worry about the equation of state in more detail? Do I need to worry about the neutrino transport in more detail? Um, what's the source of instabilities? What's causing this convection? So when, uh, when the basic model first came out by Mark Harant, um, he was thinking it was more uh, Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities. You have a strong entropy gradient. Um, that drives the explosions. But there are other instabilities that can drive explosions. There's one that Roger Chevalier proposed that John Blondin then uh, uh, sold for supernova called the standing accretion shock instability. There's different instabilities that are causing this turbulence. But right now we're at that point where we, we kind of agree on the... Uh, that this is the important part of the explosion. We just don't agree on exactly what's the most important physics. So here's, here's another, these are the, this, this is the out moving bubbles uh, in a, an explosion as I'm going through time and you see it moving out and you can see that it, in the end it drives, uh, you know, some strong low mode convective bubbles going outward driving an explosion. Um, so that's our picture. Um, um, what we can do with that picture is we can, we can ask the question of, we had this model that released 10 to the 53 ergs of energy collapsing from an iron core down to a neutron star. How do we explain, and if you were in any supernova meeting back in the um, uh, you know, 90s or 2000s, the question that any observer would ask would be, you just released 10 to the 53 ergs, how come all supernova we see are only 10 to the 51 ergs? It turns out the reason this question is no longer asked is that we have some supernova that are stronger than 10 to the, a few times 10 to the 51 ergs, but most supernova are around 10 to the 51 ergs. This basic convection model actually explains that. Um, and here's the picture. I have that put now I have a toy diagram from my, my, uh, my previous cut. I have that put a neutron star. I have this convective region. I have material falling in on it. I know what the pressure of that material is, it's one half rho v squared, that's the pressure that I have to overcome to drive an explosion. I can ask the question, how much energy can I store in here before I have enough pressure to overcome that? It's a simple derivation. I can make that derivation and, and ask the question, what, is, what kind of energy do I have? And I'll just put it, there it is, that's, those are the equations. Um, I, can, I can derive what that energy is. Once it starts to push out, I can maybe add a little bit more energy. I can have material fall back in and drive more energy. I can add some more energy, but that pretty much places a limit on the explosion energy. It's once, once it starts blowing out, I've turned off my engine. I'm no longer getting any more neutrino heat because once I explode out, the neutrinos are pretty optically thin. They're just gonna leak out. So I'm not getting that much more energy. That gives me a limit on how much energy my explosion is. And it's a function of when does the explosion happen for a given star. So that it's a function of that ram pressure from the uh, given star. If, this, if the explosion happens in the first couple or 100 milliseconds, the explosion energy where it will be, and this is 0.1 times 10 to the 51 ergs. This is 1 times 10 to the 51 ergs. And here you are looking at 2 to 3 pho is the kind of explosion energy you can expect from a collapsed core under this convective engine. So this convective engine says it can only make explosions 
of a few times 10 to the 51 ergs. That's its natural explosion energy. Um, the only way to get more energy from one of these explosions is to say that you are somehow adding energy after the launch of the explosion. And that can happen. You get a material fall back down. You can have a magnetar form in the center. You can do some um, other uh, additional engines to drive more energy. But the standard core collapse convective engine, which is now our standard engine, says that most explosions should only be at the 10 to the 51 or air level. Um, and it also places some limits on where will you succeed and where will you fail. Um, this is, uh, these are stars with no mass loss, but as a function of progenitor mass, I can estimate the explosion energy compared to the binding energy and see what kind of stars, I, you know, what kind of fates I expect in stars. Um, so here's that binding energy of stars. This is the explosion energy I expect out of a normal um, uh, core collapse convective engine. And what it tells me is for stars between about whatever the lowest iron core mass is, so around eight solar masses, up to about 20, 23 solar masses, I get strong supernova explosions and I form a neutron star. Above that, I get these weak supernova explosions and, or no explosion at all, and I make black holes. Um, so this was a prediction in 1999 at the at the time, uh, it, it kind of predicted a range of neutron star masses. The only neutron stars we had at the time were all 1.4 solar masses. So it, it, did, it actually contradicted observations. And we'll talk more about remnant masses in a bit. Um, observations now show that there is a range of neutron star masses, as well as a range of black hole masses. And this was coming just from that convective engine. Again, a reason why. The, at least the engine physicists think this is the engine behind core collapse supernova. Um, the, um, the one thing that has changed in the observations is in the, you know, in the early, before uh, mid-1990s, all supernova were in these kind of weak, you know, there were 10 to 51 ergs or weaker. So we saw we had a lot of supernova going off, they were all 10 to the 51 ergs. This is the energy where they all were. And then there was a, in the late 90s, we started getting these weak supernova that were um, uh, believed to be more massive stars, but in this range where they, um, um, in fact, they were exactly fitting in this range of explosion where they were weak explosions. Probably these are forming black holes, um, but they, they came from more massive stars. So we called uh, Ken Nomoto, this is a picture of Ken Nomoto, who's turning, um, he's turning 65 this year. Um, yeah, I think he's turning 65. He's either turning 65 or 70 this year. Um, 70. 70, thank you. He's turning 70, yeah, sorry. Um, so he's turning 70 this year. Um, he, he proposed these as a faint supernova branch, and these are normal supernova. But we also discovered these very bright supernova. This very bright, this hypernova branch, you can already see it. Ken was arguing that these were going to be jets. This bright supernova jet branch has to have a different explosion mechanism. So just as in 1As, it looks like there's a normal branch. For us, it's these and maybe these weak ones. Um, they're all in that convective engine model. They're explaining all these. There are a set of bright supernova, these hypernova um, objects that are, look like they have jet-like outflows, and they are a different engine altogether. We think those are also very massive stars. We actually think these are stars that fail to explode um, in the normal supernova. So they're in this range of masses. So they're failing to explode under the normal supernova engine, and they're producing um, this, some other engine occurs that produces the hypernova. Um, so I wanted to, at this point, I just wanted to um, give the basic idea. So I, the way my lectures are going to go is I'm going to talk about different sets of observations and why we believe we have some clue of the engine of, of core collapse supernova. We're in a different situation than um, uh, the type 1A models where the type 1A models, you, you ignite them, they explode, they make nice energies. They're at the level of comparing details of what are the, let's get these spectral lines right. In core collapse supernova, we're still trying to match broad 
you know, broad brush observations, things like remnant masses, things like do we even get a, a, a normal light curve? We're not worried about spectral line um, shapes and things like that as much. Um, the shapes actually tell you something about the velocities, but we're just still trying to make the explosions happen and know when they happen. Um, to this lecture, I focused on just what are the energetics? Can we explain the energetics? Can we explain the fact that in the core collapse, we release 10 to the 53 ergs, but only get about 10 to the 51 ergs out? Um, can, you know, what else can my, you know, engine explain if I, I have that? I explain some weak supernova, but I can't explain the really strong supernova, the 10 to the 52 erg explosions, the 10 fo. So um, there's some natural things that the convective engine explains. There are subsets of supernova that it uh, clearly can't, and we'll talk about that in some of the future lectures. Um, so the plan for the lectures are, uh, I guess this afternoon now, I will talk about um, collapsed progenitors. So I showed you that Kippenhahn diagram. We'll go into a lot more detail about what we know about uh, supernova progenitors. Then I'll talk about how these GRBs and these hypernova kind of uh, started to teach us some new things about the supernova engines. Um, I will then go into uh, a little bit more on the standard engine physics and how it predicts compact remnants and the compact remnant masses. Uh, we, were, uh, we, we talked about a little bit how um, the fact that we, this standard engine, does predict that sometimes you make neutron stars, sometimes you make black holes. I'll go into a lot more detail about the range of ma uh, neutron star masses and black hole masses that we can produce. I'm then going to talk about supernova asymmetries. It was, remember, it was the mixing of the nickel that drove us to understand that there must be some, something driving asymmetries in the explosion mechanism itself. Um, we'll talk about nucleosynthetic yields, um, how we calculate light curves for core collapse supernova. Fritz went over this a little bit for 1As. 1A supernova are much simpler, again, much simpler than uh, core collapse. There's a lot more mess in a core collapse supernova light curve. Um, and part of that is because you came from a massive star, you have to deal with all of the surrounding medium in a massive star. Massive stars, as we know, are not um, clean objects anyway. They have outbursts before death. Um, uh, so they have, conv the convection can get uh, very turbulent. They can drive outflows. We'll talk about, um, we'll, we'll take what we know about progenitors and apply that to the uh, supernova light curves. Um, and then my last two lectures, we'll cover two other observations. Um, we already talked about neutrinos a little bit, how they actually showed us that the collapse happens. Um, and we know a neutron star formed because we got the neutrinos to match that. But I'll talk a little bit about how um, we've been studying neutrinos. If we ever get another galactic supernova, um, the neutrinos will provide some nice clues into the physics. Similarly, gravitational waves can pro provide clues into the physics. And there's a lot of work done in the supernova community studying both gravitational waves and neutrinos with the hope that we'll have a core collapse supernova that's nearby. And we can actually use it to really probe the physics behind core collapse supernova. Um, so that's the plan that I have for the, the rest of the lectures. Um, and with that, I'll stop and get questions. Question, Chris? Yes. Uh, you showed this nice overview that's a function of the initial stellar masses, the regular supernovae, and then the fallback black hole production and the direct black hole production. I think this is probably coming out of multi-D simulation at some point. There, there are attempts of, of mimicking things in, in spherical 1D calculation, like so-called Erdl and, and Woosley. And I think that they also produce these areas where you form black holes above 25 solar masses, but, but they don't get far back. They, they do it also directly. What would be your answer? To that? So, so they, so the, how you do the 1D explosion can dramatically change your result. Um, the, the code that Stan uses for this, they typically use a piston to drive the explosion. Um, so we did a study, I did a study with Patrick Young, and I tried both a piston 
And then there's the models that other people use where they're just doing energy injection. And depending on how you do the energy injection or, or the piston, you can get a lot of fallback or no fallback at all. And the problem with the 1D models is exactly that, is that they, um, you know, the, the, how you do that inner boundary, how you do that energy injection can really dramatically change how much fallback you have. Um, I guess the way to say it is, in the 3D models, we only model the early times of fallback, but all of the 3D models have material always flowing back down, even from, you know, even at the few second period, the, the shock is going out, but material is sneaking back in. So fallback um, almost certainly occurs, um, depending, you know, the, the, so the weakness of doing 1D models to study this is if you don't, or if you aren't really careful about how you inject that energy, you can get no fallback whatsoever. I think the answer is that you always get some fallback. The question is, is it only, if it's only a tenth of the solar mass, I don't care. Um, and what range of models actually get a lot of fallback? Continu continuous fallback during the explosion, or has it a successful explosion which forms a neutron star and later on they have... So the fallback, I think, is happening continuously from the launch of the explosion on, and it do then does the standard, um, you know, eventually it goes into this standard. Roger Chauvet did this, this derivation for fallback. It has this falls at t to the minus 5 thirds, it will eventually go right onto that curve. And I think most calculations that do it in multi-D eventually see that they see some fallback. It's the very early fallback is hard to determine, but then it falls off as t to the minus 5 thirds. Um, um, now, how big this range of fallback black hole is, is one that you can argue about. Um, there's even a place where Depending on the stellar progenitors, there's some w weird effects, and I'll talk about this more when I talk about remnants, where the, um, the, um, the stellar core, the iron core actually gets smaller again and then bigger. So the, the, if, if, you, if you use, there's a term that I don't really like, but it, it, the compactness parameter, it, it gets to a place where you might expect somewhere here back again supernova and then, and then fall. And it, and it really then it depends on the details of the stellar evolution. Um, so there, you know, it's much more messy than this simple picture. But there is, you know, the, the trend is that you're going to be more likely to make black holes as you go this way, neutron stars here. And the, the size of the fallback range could be fairly narrow, there, where you have considerable fallback. Where you have fallback of a solar mass, that may be only a small mass range that you can do. That. So instead of, right now I have, this whole thing is making black holes through fallback, and it could be that that range is really a narrow window between you know, 30 and 35 solar masses, and that's it. There was a question here. Could you please explain uh, these rings around uh, 87? Yeah, so this is, well, do I have the, can I get back to the picture quickly? Um, so the, there we are. Um, Most of stellar evolution, and so I told you already that 87A was a blue supergiant, and, and, and the, the simple models had predicted a red supergiant. Um, one of the solutions to how you explain the blue supergiant is this, uh, this pro the progenitor of this star was in a binary um, before collapse. And in fact, the picture that Philip Podsielowski came up with back in the 80s was exactly this, where he had a, a, a companion to this massive star. The massive star went giant. The companion started to spiral in, um, and it eventually merged with the core before it collapsed. And that's what he, he predicted for the progenitor of 1987A. So now let's look at these rings. Um, the, the compa this massive star has a companion right next to it that's going to funnel its winds. So it's going to actually not have spherically symmetric winds. It's going to have winds that are, have some shape to them caused by the, um, the binary. When it spirals in, it actually causes some mass to get ejected. This, would, so there's lots of pictures, lots of ideas of how to explain this. But these rings are all in the circumstellar medium. This ring being caused by that final in-spiral merger 
causing mass to get ejected. These outer rings are really funnels going out like this. So you have these cones going out like this. And this is just the light from the supernova shining on those cones. And what you see is, is a ring. We can, we can look at this in more detail, but there's, there were uh, several models. Uh, the earliest ones I know were done by Crystal Martin and Dave Arnett, but I'm sure there were ones even before that where they just did that. They, they followed those winds, they did the asymmetric wind loss, and then asked, itself, asked themselves, as the supernova goes off and lights up those, those funnels, can I do what, what kind of picture do I see? And they match these rings quite well. Um, so this is actually the circumstellar medium causing these ring features. This is also from um, uh, binary, uh, the binary interaction causing a shell of material to move out. The, the supernova shock now is, is destroying this, this inner ring of material. And so we're actually studying that material right now. So we, we know a little bit about that mass ejecta. But this brings up an important point. I'm going to talk about progenitors. Um, most of what we know is from single star evolution, but we also know that most stars are in binaries. Most massive stars are in binaries, probably over half of which are interacting binaries, where before the death of the star, there will be some mass transfer. Um, so th this is what makes it really messy to look at supernova light curves and figure out anything because there's a lot of material on top in these massive stars, and that interaction can change what it looks like. Um, and in fact, this is a, 87A is a mild uh, effect on the uh, um, supernova emission. Um, you know, at some point we'll get uh, the menagerie of supernova light curves from um, Alicia, but uh, there's, there's a whole set of different types. There's a type 2N supernova that we almost are certain are caused by interactions with shells of ejecta from the, mass, the, the star before death. And that could either be through explosive burning, some kind of instability in the star, or it could be from binary effects. So we actually expect to have this kind of uh, mass ejecta. Um, 87A just happens to be one that was close enough that we get to see uh, the features of that um, uh, mass ejecta in the, in the images. Um. Another question, please? Yes? Um, how close was the second 87A? 87A was in the uh, Magellanic Clouds. So it was, it was and um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this more, but there's this, you know, if you look at the supernova rate, it's, you know, the neutrino people were claiming as low as once every 20 years in the Milky Way. Um, I will show you the rate. It can be much longer, but we're overdue for another one nearby. Um, um, and uh, if you're a neutrino or a nuclear particle physicist, it's been uh, frustrating to have to wait, you know, over over the you know 20, 30 years when you know we should have one any day now. Um, uh, there are people like me, uh, starting to Thomas Yanka. We're dreading the day when when another nearby one happens, because then that's when all our models will be shown for sure to be wrong, and we'll have to go back to the drawing board. But at this point, um, this is the only nearby one we've had um, um, in, well, in the period of time when we have a lot of the detectors, like neutrino detectors and um, uh, strong X-ray and gamma ray detectors. So this has provided us a lot of the data that we have on supernova. The last question before we I wonder why both thermonuclear and corpulous mechanism both produce similar one-fold energy. So, <laughs> um, the 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 nice thing about the thermonuclear supernova is their energy they get they have a prediction for how much energy they can get. If you blew up the entire white dwarf into a nickel fifty-six, and Fitz probably has this number, you can't get much more energy than what he's getting, right? So he's getting around 10 to 51 ergs. He's burning half of the star into to nickel fifty-six. He can only get about twice as much if he burned the entire star, which would be hard to do. That's why they get their energy. Um, the energetics we get from our core collapse supernova are all from that, I can only have so much energy stored in that convective region. Um, um, so, but for core collapse, you could ask the question, why am I not getting some that are 10 to the 52 up to 10 to the 53 ergs? Um, and the fact of the matter is we see some rare supernova that are 10 to the 52 and 10, you know, ergs. 
They're called gamma ray bursts, they're collapsars. So we do, we can get more energy. The reason most of, the reason all the 1As are 10 to 51 is that's as much as you can get from nuclear burning. The reason the core collapse, most of them are where they are, is because of this uh, convective engine side. Um, but you could, exp you, you know, nature should produce some more ex energetic explosions, and we think they do in the gamma ray bursts. And I think they'll talk about that more on, on uh, Tuesday. So. So let's thank Chris.